but there's not a weapon delivered in Iraq or in Afghanistan that wasn't delivered there by petroleum. And the forces, the average GI in Iraq or Afghanistan today uses 16 gallons of oil per soldier per day, four times as much as in the first Persian Gulf War and 16 times as much as in World War II to show you that we our military power, increasingly global, increasingly mechanized, is completely dependent on petroleum. The total petroleum consumption will rise in order to retain that percentage rate from its current level of about uh, 22 million barrels a day to about 27 million barrels a day. You better start asking yourself, where the hell is that oil gonna come from? Because oil provides such a large share of our energy consumption, it also counts for the largest share of our carbon dioxide emissions in this country, which of course are the leading component of the greenhouse gases that are responsible for global climate change. According to the Department of Energy, oil use in the U.S. accounts for 44% of our total carbon dioxide emissions, far more than from coal or any other source. It is by driving our vehicles and uh, you know, our cars and everything else. That's how we in this country, at any rate, are largely causing global climate change and we're the leading emitter. Friends, I don't think I have to spell this out to you unless we overcome our addiction to petroleum and do something to alter these projections, there's nothing. We have no hope of reversing the buildup of greenhouse gases that we've heard about and the effects that they'll have, even if we make progress on other fronts. Then the problem of global warming then in this country, at least, is a problem of petroleum use. And it's especially a problem of petroleum use in transportation because that's where most of our oil is used. And so the number one challenge is to get people out of their petroleum-fueled cars into first SUVs, then entirely battery-powered vehicles, cars, and into bicycles, light rail, and other transportation alternatives. Nothing else is more important than that. Anything else you do is good, helps, but if we don't solve that, the rest will be for naught. Well, that's, that's oil and climate change. Let me take a few minutes to talk about the other threats, peak oil and resource depletion and resource conflict. I think most of you know what peak oil is about. It's the moment in which oil production worldwide reaches its maximum sustainable rate. That's usually when half of the world's petroleum, believed to be when half of the world's oil has been consumed. I am pretty convinced that half of the world's conventional petroleum has been consumed, so we are very likely at the point of peak oil now, and another year or two, it's pretty irrelevant. Now, we're not gonna notice this right away because the oil industry and the Department of Energy this year no longer talks about oil in their statistics. They're talking about liquids or petroleum liquids because now they're beginning to bring in liquids from Canada, tar sands, from shale oil, from natural gas liquids. So they will stretch out this peak for another decade or so with other kinds of liquids but the day of conventional oil is here. What year it is is not a matter that matters very much to me. What you need to know is that the era of cheap, abundant oil is over for good. It will never come back again. All of the easy to get at oil is gone. What's left is the tough oil. What do I mean by tough oil? The dangerous oil, the hazardous oil, it's either environmentally hazardous or politically hazardous. Where in the U.S. is the Department of Energy focusing and the Bush administration in promoting new oil and gas drilling in the deep waters in the, of the Gulf of Mexico? Exactly the area where the hurricane tracks of the most 
destructive hurricanes of the past decade have crossed in the middle of the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this, this and, and of course global warming is going to increase the severity of hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's, it'll either be hazardous environmentally or in the Arctic where they're promoting energy production or it's hazardous politically. It's hazardous because three quarters of the world's remaining petroleum reserves are in countries that have a majority Muslim population. Three quarters of the remaining world's oil are in countries with a majority Muslim population. Now, President Bush can go to those countries and say that we are there to promote human rights and democracy. <laughs> and some people here may believe it. The President, I think, believes his own words. I truly do. And some people in the media might believe that. Some people in his own party might believe that. Polls show that the overwhelming majority of the people in the Middle East do not. <laughs> they believe that we're there for one reason only, to plunder their riches. And they are increasingly determined not to let that happen. Most of them reject the violent methods of Osama bin Laden to drive us out of their lands. They don't believe in violence necessarily. They may take other forms of political resistance. But wherever we go for our oil in the years ahead, we will meet resistance. It might be violent, it may be other forms. We will meet resistance. And so the military is being converted into a global oil protection service so that we could feed our need for petroleum in the only places in the world where there's any petroleum left, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Venezuela, in Central Asia. Those are the only places that have any oil. So through our need to supply more and more of this, it is completely controlling and transforming our foreign policy into a military policy. Essentially, the foreign policy and military policy of the United States, our anti-terrorism policy, which by the way is a policy of protecting pipelines against sabotage, all of them have been completely taken over as a policy essentially of plunder of foreign oil in dangerous areas because that's the only way to sustain our addiction to oil, cheap oil, abundant oil. That is why all of the issues that are being addressed, in my view, for us as Americans, make that very clear. Our priority is to address the problem of oil. As a human species, at planet-wise, we also have to address the problems, I agree, of coal and other substances, deforestate, other problems, deforestation, that contribute to global warming. But our problem as Americans is the perfidious effect that the addiction we developed to oil when it was plentiful has had in perverting our foreign policy and military policy, leading us into one war after the other as it destroys the environment. So, in my mind, finding strategies for ending this dependence on oil has to be our number one priority in this country. And it's, it's a two-part strategy. It's, it's really a three-part strategy because it, it has a foreign policy and military policy dimension of repudiating wars for oil. That has to be, you know, the first part. Absolutely have to repudiate the Carter Doctrine. That's the name of it. I hate to be, I hate to say that it's associated with a president who I largely admire. But the Carter Doctrine says that that protection of foreign oil is a vital interest of the United States and for that reason we'll use military force if necessary to protect it. We have to repudiate the Carter Doctrine and say no American lives 
let alone foreign lives, will ever be sacrificed so that people could waste oil in obscenely fuel efficient vehicles. <laughs> Second, we have to stop wasting oil in the vehicles we have. I've spoken to that. And third, we have to develop other alternative forms of transportation that don't require the consumption of petroleum liquids. Developing the alternative systems of public transportation, bike paths, and electric powered hybrids, and all of the rest, that is the challenge that America has to put at the top 